Steve, I still hear the music in the background. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to admit everybody to the meeting at this point. Oh, there's Mayor. Give everybody just one more minute. We still have people joining the meeting. All right. Good morning, everyone. I am Shauna Haley, Director of Communications and Community Outreach for the City of Plano. And thank you so very much for joining us today for our neighborhood leadership meeting. We host these meetings quarterly for the president or their designated representative of our HOAs, our neighborhood associations and our crime watch groups. And we're thankful for your time uh, this morning. We're, we're going to get started here in about a minute um, and we'll promise to give you your time back right at nine o'clock. We have a full agenda today and um, I'm going to turn the meeting over at this point to our Mayor John Munns. Um, Mayor Munns, I have control of the PowerPoint and I'm going to go ahead and bring that up um, as soon as you start speaking. All right. Thank you, Chan. I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Before we uh, uh, get to the presentations this morning, I want to recognize our council members and city management in attendance this morning. <clears throat> council members in attendance on the Zoom meeting are Mayor Pro Tem Casey Prince, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem Maria Tu, Council Member Rick Grady, and Council member Shelby Williams. If there's another council member out there, um, let me know. I, I, uh, I'm just going off a of script. Um, the city management in attendance uh, on our Zoom meeting today is our city manager, Mark Israelson, Deputy City Manager, Greg Russian, and Deputy City Manager, Jack Carr, and Deputy City Manager, Shelly Simer. So, Today is the first time to meet with you all, and thank you for taking the time from your schedule to join us. But even more, your time and commitment to your neighborhoods through service with our HOA, Neighborhood Association and Crime Watch group. It's my pleasure to serve as your mayor. mayor. I lived in Plano for over 50 years, and I'm proud to, to be a Plano Senior High graduate uh, a long time ago. Um, Plano's been a wonderful home uh, for myself and my family, and my wife and I are thrilled that our three children chose to call Plano their home, and we enjoy watching now our grandchildren grow up here. So we're all here in Plano, and I'm deeply committed to community service. Some of you may know my dad, he, who, who I think when I hear Mayor Munns uh, is him and, and not myself, has uh, given me a... Uh, a service and giving back mentality in this community and many, many times over the years, uh, including my time as chair on the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, Economic Development Board, and many years on the Plano Independent School District Board of Trustees. As your mayor and fellow long-term Planoite, it's important to me to maintain our sense of community. I've lived here all my life and I love Plano, and at our core, we're still a small community with strong shared values. And our secret ingredient, obviously, is the people of Plano. We're all diverse and we're inclusive. We embrace this about ourselves. And it's one of our strengths. As you know, Plano is frequently included in the plethora of accolades relating to the quality of life, from our great schools and great and safe neighborhoods to our economic strength and abundance of jobs. I plan to facilitate conversations across the community to allow folks to share their thoughts. I think in the end, we will find that we have more in common than we don't in collaboration between our council, our city, citizens, and stakeholders 
will go a long way towards finding a balance of shared purpose that serves our community well for many years to come. We know that you will have questions for our presenters. We have reserved time at the end of our meeting for questions and answers. If you will, please hold your questions until the end. Uh, so let's get started. First up this morning is Director of Budget, Karen Rhodes Whitley. She'll provide us with an overview of the proposed 2021-2022 budget. Karen? Karen, you're still on mute. Karen, can you unmute yourself? Couldn't find the unmute button. <laughs> Am I muted now? Can you hear me? Yes, you're Yay. fine. <laughs> this new screen, I was like, where is it? Okay, the city manager <laughs> presented his recommended budget and proposed CIP to city council the other night. We have many work sessions, uh, many meetings planned all the way up to September 13th. Uh, when the city council will be adopting the budget and the tax rate. I'm going to run through a couple of slides with you. Uh, the first slide I wanted to talk about, uh oh. The first slide I wanted to talk about was the city manager has five goals or uh, focuses for the budget this year. It's And it's been his same goals and focus the last three years. It's a budget for sustaining Plano's excellence. Uh, we wanna make sure we're taking care of our quality infrastructure, which now totals $2.7 billion. We wanna make sure that all our uh, demands for services are met, that we keep with our financial policies and our AAA bond rating, which we have had since the year 2001. Also, we want to make the property tax rate very affordable to not only our residents, but commercial. And then we want to make sure that our personnel, our employees are taken care of in the process. The budget resources are revenues for Hold on. Shauna, I don't know that this is working. Hold on. Okay. Sorry. Are you on the correct slide now? Yes. Okay. Um, the budget revenues for this year total $699 million. This is for all our combined budget. The number one revenue source we have is for taxes, which makes up 43.7% of our revenue. This is property taxes plus sales tax. And then our second largest comes from charges for services, which totals 226 million or 32%. And the majority of that is due to water and sewer, what we need to charge for water and sewer and for solid waste services. Okay, our combined budget expenditures this year total $638 million. This is the expense side. The last couple of years, our water and sewer contract was overtaking what we were even spending on public safety uh, due to the fact that our contract has been reworked and will be phased in over the next several years. Now our water and sewer makes up $165 million of our expenditures or 25.9%. We now, we have public safety being spent at 165 million or 25.8%. So that is good to see that we are not spending as much on the water and sewer contract. Our general fund expenditures total $353 million. 
The majority of general fund goes for public safety and health at 46.6%. And then the dark blue share, that's our non-departmental and transfers. And this is where we house our transfer that goes from the general fund over to our capital maintenance fund. And that's how we take care of our infrastructure uh, that we were speaking about earlier that totals $2.7 million. Let's talk about property taxes. We've received the information in from the Central Appraisal District. The office is currently working on what our no new revenue rate will be. Right now we have a preliminary estimate of 44.69 cents included in the budget. We have the same property tax rate as the last two years. The city council will be discussing the property tax rate at the city council meeting, which is scheduled for August 9th. Uh, right now, we have assessed property values of 47.7 billion. That's up from 46.6. What did that increase come from? 613 million is due to new property. Our existing property uh, went up by $514 million. You will see the dark blue in the slide. That is your existing property values. The increases over and over and over. The last several years or over the last 10 years, existing property has really gone up. In fact, what was leading the increase in the existing property was our commercial values going up. However, due to COVID, what's gone on this year is our residential properties have increased because of the flurry of buying uh, for residents and selling their homes, but our commercial values did go down. So the majority of that 514 there is due to increases in residential or single family homes. This is another way you can see it last year. Uh, commercial values made up 53% and residential made up 47% of the assessed property valuations. Commercial now has gone down to 52% and residential at 48%. A lot of people always say that multifamily uh, is not paying taxes or the individuals living in multifamily are not paying taxes. However, they do. They're just charged out of the rates that the uh, commercial owners are charging for rents. Uh, we have three separate uh, places where property taxes come from. The single family makes up 48.1% or 102 million. However, I wanted to point out right underneath there, last year, single family paid a 97.8 million or 46.9%. This year, though, they're going to be paying 48% because the housing values have increased. Uh, the commercial value has gone down. They were paying in 41.6% last year. They're going to be paying 40.3. And then multifamily went up a little bit. Uh, they were paying 11.5 and now they'll be paying 11.6. So you see how the breakout is the 48% is coming from residential and then the 52% uh, is coming from commercial. The average home did increase from 378,000 to 396,000. That's a 4.8% increase. Now this is the average home. The central appraisal district takes all the home values and just divides out. It's a very simple calculation and divides out by the number of homes. So that is how that average home value is received. Uh, total e exemptions. The city of Plano gives a lot of exemptions. Uh, off the appraised property value, we have $10.7 billion in exemptions. Revenue savings that go out for our residents and uh, through tax abatements on commercial properties totals $48.3 million. And then, of course, we do have the 65 and over tax freeze. We've gained about a million uh, dollars in savings to all of them uh, on this tax roll. The average home value, 
the citizens are paying yes for the city of Plano, but we only make up 19% of the tax bill. You will see the breakout here on uh, everyone else for PISD, it's 67% for the county about 9%. And then the uh, Collin College District is 4%. The average homeowner will this next year pay $7,310. Sales tax. Sales tax was is one of our main financial policies. Uh, we have a we go by a three year rolling average for our projections. Uh, we started doing this back in 2008 during the Great Economic Recession. It's worked very very well for us, especially through COVID. Uh, we are. Oh, I'm sorry. On the sales tax cap policy, we put in our projections, the three-year average net out any audit adjustments. Any amount that comes in over that can go for capital maintenance fund. Uh, we can use it for one-time expenditures or it can roll through on the fund balance. This is just a couple of our initiatives that we have uh, provided over the last couple of years through the overage in sales tax and the main one here is a 22.1 million to the capital maintenance fund. We have a goal on that fund of 75%. Right now we're currently at 72%. The city council did include this last year, we had $2 million come in over our sales tax projections. So it did go to the capital maintenance fund. This is a look at our receipts. Uh, we have come out of COVID quite nicely on the last couple of months of sales tax. Right now we have 88 million that we are projecting we're gonna receive. It's probably gonna be more like 89 million. We will know in August. And then for next year, our projection is 87.1%. A couple of budget highlights. Right now we have no new programs or services. Within the budget, we've kept uh, the existing service levels 30 days of working capital is included for our general fund. We're providing $9.4 million or two cents on the tax rate for the economic development incentive fund, our capital maintenance fund transfer increased by 8 million. We're providing 3% across the board salary increases for non-civil service and civil service. Uh, compensation plan adjustment initiative. They're going to be speaking, HR will be speaking about that at the Saturday, August uh, 14th um, work session. We do have CIP coming online, the total $2.2 million. Uh, the bond referendum that we had, the $364 million bond referendum, we did tell voters we might have to have a two cent tax rate adjustment in the year 2024 in order to pay for the debt. Uh, so what we're doing is we're going ahead and we are phasing in, so we don't have to increase the tax rate. We are starting to phase in the amount of debt service that's gonna be needed with 0.25 cents going over from operations to the debt services next year. Public safety programs totaled 736,000 and then we're providing $1.4 million for books, digital materials and e-content. We did receive $18.2 million of funding from the American Rescue Plan Act. 15 million of it is going towards general fund and capital maintenance expenditures, especially a computerized signal system, which totals $8 million. Review pump station generators, sidewalk repairs, uh, some foundation fixes at the Plano Central and then the Douglas Community Center. We also are recovering lost revenue over a recreation uh, revolving fund of $1.5 million. They are probably going to lose about $6 million in revenue. And then our convention and tourism fund, a million, they've lost $15 million. CIP operating expenditures, this is just a look at where all it's going. We have a water and sewer fund. As most of y'all know, we do purchase our water from North Texas Municipal Water District due to the fact that we were able to uh, redo the contract terms over the next couple of years. Instead of paying the 26 for 26.7 billion uh, in water, 
This year, we will be paying $26.1 million, and that is for savings of $1.5 million. However, we do have increased costs on wastewater in the Upper East Fork Interceptor that's going to come online, which is going to increase $2.2 million. So we are needing a wastewater increase of 5.5%. Built into our CIP, $305 million. The largest of this is $113 million for streets, water and sewer at $45.6 million, parks and recreation centers at 42.9, municipal drainage, 31.8, the majority of that is for the Collin Creek Mall drainage culvert. We're selling bonds at $78 million this next year for the uh, Tom Muhlenbeck Rec Center, lighting replacements, community and neighborhood park renovations for street improvements, and we're gonna start the fueling stations that were passed in the 2021 bond program. Our capital maintenance fund, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a goal of keeping 75% of the annual depreciation expenditures in there. We're currently at 72%, hopefully to make it to 76% this next year. Couple of dates on the calendar. This coming up Wednesday, August 4th, we will have a grant funding work session. August 9th is going to be a big night for the council. They will be presented the they will be presented their proposed uh, capital improvement program. We're going to have a public hearing on both the operating budget and community investment program. They'll approve the certified tax roll and also they will determine what tax rate that they are uh, thinking about passing in the upcoming year or a notice that goes into the paper. Uh, we have a town hall meeting on the budget and CIP plan for August 12th, an uh, all day city council work session on August 14th, that's a Saturday, public hearing on the tax rate to be determined. It's either gonna be August 23rd or September 13th. And then September 13th, the council's adopted uh, the operating budget, CIP and sets the tax rate. And then October 1st, we begin all this again. All this information is included on our website. Uh, the documents will be available to all libraries. And then we have an open budget web portal. You go to http dashboard.plano.gov and you will find that. And of course, you can always call at me at 972-941-7472. Thank you so much. Shauna, can I add just one uh, additional statement real quick to that uh, for those that are um, online in the community? I made a statement uh, at the council meeting when we were laying out my recommended budget that the city was close to the no new revenue rate uh, for our tax rate and committed to our city council by the end of the budget process, we would be at that no new revenue rate. So I wanted to reiterate that since I made that comment on Monday. Uh, that we're not far from it, but anticipate being able to be there by the end of the budget process. So I just wanted to add that in in case anybody was uh, was curious. Thanks. Back to you, Shauna and Mayor. Thank you, Karen, for pro providing us with the overview of the proposed budget. We'll now hear from Urban Forrester and Mark Bodwin on the state of the trees in Plano after the winter storm. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Mayor Munns. Um, I just started back in February and uh, my first week here uh, with the city was the first week that we had we were shut down. So it's definitely a, um, a week I'm going to remember. Uh, but we'll go ahead and start talking about the, the winter storm we had in Plano. Uh, you know, we had record winter low temperatures during that period of time. And we also had uh, record temperatures um, below freezing for extended periods of time. And so what I want to do here today is um, go over a few things here. And Shannon, I'm trying to click. Let's see, maybe down here. There we go. So the topics we'll discuss today is we're going to go over some of the tree damage that I've seen in Plano. Um, and we're going to go over an important part, which is how to hire an arborist for tree removal. And then we're going to go over a few frequently asked questions. Uh, all this information is on our winter storm page that uh, is live and available for everyone to see.
quick. So uh, if you've been driving around town, you've probably noticed um, a lot of trees without a canopy. Uh, this is a really good indicator that your tree was injured during the winter storm, um, followed by some of these down here. If you follow this arrow down here, I have some of these uh, epicormic sprouts. Uh, that's what we call them in our, uh, the arboriculture world. But this is always a really, really good sign that the tree uh, has been damaged. It could be winter damage, it could be insect damage, it could be uh, fungal uh, fungal problem. But in this instance, uh, what we have here is uh, new growth. And if you kind of want to think about it um, as frostbite, uh, as the frostbite moves down your hand and your fingers into the core of your hand, uh, this is what we've seen in a lot of our trees in Plano. Uh, and uh, over here on the right, I kind of wanted to talk about pre-existing conditions because some of these pre-existing conditions can exacerbate some of the, uh, the issues we have in trees. Uh, not only is the tree uh, dead above here, but we have some cavities here in the tree. And this just adds to the safety concerns that we have for a lot of these trees on um, residential properties, public properties um, uh, throughout Plano. Uh, here's another example of a tree, uh, a pre-existing condition. You know, this tree here is sitting in the right of way. Um, this tree is probably too big for this right of way. We would recommend a smaller tree, uh, but there are a lot of targets underneath these trees. Uh, these are also safety concerns that we have. You know, this truck that's parked under the tree, uh, the infrastructure that we have, our roads, our sidewalks, uh, these are all things that uh, we have major concerns over as trees start dropping limbs uh, from the winter storm. Uh, over here on the right, I've got some more pictures of these epicormic sprouts. You know, typically, you would get new growth from buds that are on the, uh, the tips of branches. But when you have a severe storm like this, uh, with all the cold weather, there are dormant buds on the trees that come out. These typically are very weak attachments and they come in bunches. So you can look at here and you can see that we have two or three or four branches all in the same area. As these branches get bigger and older, they're going to start growing into each other. Uh, and these will be a safety issue. Uh, these will need to be come in, uh, an arborist will need to come in here and selectively prune. Uh, these will need to be removed completely, but above in the tree canopy, uh, we'll have to remove a lot of those uh, new growth epicormic sprouts. Here's another example of a tree in our park system that we addressed, but this is another tree that was damaged during the storm. And I kind of wanted to bring this uh, to everyone's attention because a lot of people look at trees and they say, hey, this tree is healthy. Um, it looks really good. When in fact, uh, these trees have structural issues and we call this an included branch bark attachment. But for today, we'll call it a V branch shape. And if you look at the picture on the right where I've added the red lines, there's a crease down here. Uh, this is a very weak attachment. Uh, water will collect in this area here and over time it will rot. And so this was brought to our attention by Forrester um, in our department. And we have targets, we have a pavilion here, we have a trash can. We know this is a high traffic area. And so as an arborist, these are things that I look at when I look for safety concerns uh, for our trees and for our citizens in our parks. And so this topped with the damage from the winter storm uh, with brittle branches that can fall down, just become a hazard. Uh, this is another example of a tree uh, in um, an HOA, it's in a right of way, this tree is outgrown the space. And it also has a really big V shape right down here. And this will be a failure point uh, on the tree uh, as the tree starts to lose its leaves. And so um, I wanted to show this picture just to show you what a good branch attachment looks like. This is the opposite of a V. This is more of a mountain shape. So, uh, you know, if you're looking at your tree at your house and um, you want to know if you have good or bad branch attachments, this is always a really great indicator that you have a good branch attachment. Uh, some other symptoms I've seen on trees, and this is over at City Hall. Uh, we'll go to the picture on the right first. This is called sloughing, um, and it's where the bark uh, in the cambium layer comes completely off the tree. Uh, this tree was completely dead, uh, and it was a safety hazard in the parking lot, and we removed these trees uh, when we found them. But there are some other trees uh, like this, and these are vertical frost cracks. Now, this typically happens on trees that have really thin bark. And so this is a lace bark elm. 
Uh, we've seen a lot of damage to lace bark elm all throughout Plano. Uh, other trees that have really thin bark are maple trees, and we've seen some damage on those. Uh, but most of the frost cracking we've seen has been on lace bark. And we've seen some bark peeling as well, not quite as severe as the, the actual bark here, um, but we are concerned that some of these trees might not um, make the summer when we start getting into the um, 100 degree days of August and September. Moving on to the next slide. Oops, I'll go back. And these are other pre-existing conditions uh, outside of the bad branch attachments. You know, the, when a tree gets stressed, uh, it uh, attracts insects. And so this tree here uh, we're, we're showing signs of stress, and it's probably because of its location really close to the sidewalk. It has a limited root system. And so uh, whenever you have insects, insects are vectors. They carry fungus, they carry uh, bacteria. And once that gets into the tree, it starts uh, decaying the tree. And um, another example of a tree that you might think is a very safe tree um, actually has some safety issues. We have uh, two competing branches here. We have that V uh, shape that I talked about. Uh, so this area right here is a weak point. And when you combine that with the winter storm damage um, and insect damage, it can become an issue uh, on homeowners properties. And so I wanted to show an example of trees that can be saved. I don't want this to be all uh, gloom and doom because I do think that some of our trees are going to recover. Uh, and uh, Renee, my supervisor, uh, suggested I do this. And if you kind of take your hand and you pick a, uh, make a circle with it and put it over your eye and look at the tree and you can kind of see the resemblances of a tree, uh, then it's very possible that we can save these trees. We want to save trees that have been on properties, um, but we also have to balance that with safety concerns. Uh, and that's what we want to do is we want to protect the citizens, the pets, their neighbors. We want to protect their homes and of course our infrastructure uh, that is all around here. Uh, but a reduction pruning is a pruning where you remove the dead material out of the tree. Uh, and the reason that's so important is that as we get these, these winter or winter, as we get some of these thunderstorms in the fall, uh, these lower portion of the tree, they catch the wind, they move around, and these branches can fall off. And, and these aren't as big, uh, but they, you know, if they fall down, they, they can break a windshield, uh, they can hurt you. And we want to make sure that the citizens are aware of, of these issues. So let's go ahead and talk about hiring arborists. Now, this is probably the most important part of the topic today. Uh, you know, tree care is not regulated in Texas. And anyone with a chainsaw can come by your house and, and offer uh, to cut down your tree. And honestly, if it, you know, if it's my tree, you know, I'm going to look for someone who gives me the cheapest cost to take down my tree. Uh, but sometimes uh, that's not always the best decision. So we'll talk about a few things real quick uh, about insurance. You know, are you insured? These are questions that we're going to want to ask the contractors that come out to our homes. Uh, do you have an ISA certification? Uh, are you going to be roping down limbs? If your tree is real big, you're going to want to have your limbs roped down. Uh, how are you going to protect everything I have on my property, my sprinkler system, my home, uh, my neighbor's home? You know, if your tree is hanging over their house. And then can you explain to me the tree removal process? So are you insured? Uh, you know, not all landscapers are going to have this insurance. Um, if something happens on a property, the homeowner can be liable uh, for insurance. So we want to make sure, and this is extremely important, we want to make sure that the uh, tree care company has workers comp insurance. Uh, landscape insurance, they may or may not have that. The workers' comp insurance will protect the homeowner in case there is an accident on the property. And you can go to this website here. You can look to verify that the company has uh, the insurance that you're looking for, or you can ask the contractor to produce their document. Um, ISA certification, that is a certification that arborists have, such as myself, uh, I was going to blur this out here because it shows my expiration. I can assure you that mine is up to date. I'm just waiting for it in the mail. But certified arborists have a higher level, level of knowledge and skills to properly care for trees. Um, there's a reason that there's an expiration date. We have to recertify every three years. We get 30 hours of um, continuing education credits. 
And, and we learn the new best management practices. So arborists that have ISA certifications um, are highly recommended, but it's not as important as being insured. Roping down limbs, of course, we wanna make sure that the contractors on big trees are doing this. Um, and so you wanna ask them how they're going to do it, if they're going to do it, because we wanna, again, we wanna protect uh, our neighbors, we wanna protect our, our home, uh, our infrastructure, our streets uh, from damage. Another thing you can do is, you know, ask them, you know, what, how are you gonna do it? You know, are you gonna put up protection zones on your property? Are you gonna flag? A good thing you could do is, is make sure they flag your irrigation, your sprinkler heads. If they're gonna bring uh, big equipment on your property, you're gonna want them to, to flag any kind of irrigation uh, holes or irrigation flags. Uh, especially when they're they're bringing their their grinder to grind the stump, and these are just little things that that will help you protect um, your property. And then you know you want to just ask them in general. You know, make sure they have a plan. You know, the whole reason behind asking this question is that they're just not, you know, a door to door salesman that's coming out here to make a quick buck. You know, I I get it. You know, people have a lot of trees and and. There's a lot of opportunity to to uh, to make money taking down trees, and, and we just want to protect our citizens. Um, I have this link here, but I, I won't play this. But basically, this video uh, shows someone on a ladder. It's a homeowner, and he cuts down a branch. And there's a woman with a baby holding a, a rope on her property, and the branch comes down and, and knocks him down off off the ladder. Now he wasn't injured, but again, the the first comment that that person had was hire tree care professionals. And I cannot enforce this enough. So I'll get into the frequently asked questions. I only have two or three on here. The rest of them, like, like I said, are posted on the website. Uh, these are trees that uh, over at our event center. We lost a lot of trees uh, over here. We had to remove them, uh, but we will be replacing them with a future project. But the general consensus among arborists right now is to wait until the end of summer. Uh, we had the big winter snap and we went through two months of extended rain and now we're going to be going through a period of, of more of our uh, summer droughts uh, and high temperatures. So that's why we're kind of saying, let's wait, let's give these trees a time to recover. In general, if your tree has more than 60% of its canopy, more than likely this tree can be saved. It's the trees that have a lot of growth at the trunk of the tree that are going to be an issue. And in some trees have, have pushed out new growth and, and I have seen quite a few trees recover better than a lot of the arborists uh, and I have talked about. And we've been meeting on the side uh, monthly discussing the winter damage in our areas. And, and this is basically the general consensus. But if you haven't seen any growth on your trees, we highly recommend that you take your trees down and that you find a reputable ar arborist. Uh, why do you have to remove your tree? I've kind of gone, gone over this, but here's a picture of a, a tree that was already dead, uh, been dead for a while as trees age and uh, they will get brittle. If they're already dead and they're aging, uh, some trees are better at it than other trees. Ash trees um, are actually not really good at this. They tend to fall apart as they're dead. And so we want to make sure that we're protecting everybody again. Safety, safety, safety. Uh, where can I stack the wood that has been cut? Uh, for the most part in Plano, if you have an alleyway, uh, you wanna put brush and, and um, dead wood material in the back. But what we wanna make sure uh, and we highly recommend is that you, when you negotiate the contractor removing your material, you want to make sure that they include removing all of the, the debris. Uh, there's a, a limited amount of debris that the city will remove. Uh, after that, it becomes bulk. And you can look at this website here to, to see what the policies are on that. And so that, got, that goes everything. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions anytime you have a question on trees. I love trees. Um, I'm really disappointed that my first week was, was this winter storm, but we, we do have a lot of good things to look forward to. Uh, we have new tree plantings and um, that's something to be happy about. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We will now hear about the Neighborhood Leadership Academy from Neighborhood Planner, Wendy Mora from the Neighborhood Services Department. Wendy. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am just waiting here for the, there's a slight delay and we'll get started here. I'm just waiting for the mouse control. If 
But yes, I'm going to talk to you today about our Neighborhood Leadership Academy. We are um, excited about this program. It's a newer program with Neighborhood Services. We actually started it back in 2019. And um, getting ready for our third cohort um, for the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. So our applications are currently open. Um, here we go. And um, just to give you a little bit of background on what the Neighborhood Leadership Academy is, it's a training and leadership program for all of our voluntary neighborhood groups. So it could be a crime watch group or neighborhood association and it's basically designed to help strengthen neighborhood leadership and increase engagement within your community um, oops a little faster there um, and it is uh, going to be meeting once per month on the third Tuesday evening uh, through a mixture of in-person and virtual sessions. In addition, we'll have some office hours available for our groups to obtain one-on-one -on -one assistance as well. And one thing to note, there is no class in December, so we do take a break during the month of December. Um, our participants will um, help our, well, the program is designed to help our Plano neighborhood groups create or enhance mission, vision, and goals, um, assess community strengths and gaps, market your neighborhood, how do you engage your residents and utilize your community's assets. You'll also have the opportunity to network with other groups and receive mentorship from past participants. And in order to qualify for the program, um, you just need to be a voluntary group that is registered with the city of Plano with four active board members uh, or and then just two members need to be attending each session. Um, in order to apply, you'll just need to visit share.plano.gov forward slash NLA app 2021. And that will be, oops. I'm going to go back one here. <laughs> um, that's, again, uh, the, the website is here for you. And then um, the applications will be reviewed um, by our staff and will be notified of the acceptance into the Neighborhood uh, Leadership Academy in mid-September. And at that time, um, you will have a short uh, interview prior to that. And then a kickoff event will be held uh, later on in September, just so that you know the process moving forward. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me via email or by phone. I'm happy to help out with any questions or just let you know a little bit more about the program. And that is what I have today for the Neighborhood Leadership Academy. And I'll turn that back over to you all. Thank you. Thank you for providing, uh, thank you for pro providing us with that information, Wendy. Uh, we'll now open the rest of the meeting to answer questions you may have for Cedar, uh, city leadership. Uh, so we will now open it up for questions. I have a question about the, um, it was presented earlier about the water district uh, renewal and the, and the contract and, uh, but there was a, um, uh, Upper East Fork, um, something mentioned uh, Upper East Fork, is that a, uh, is that what's being built out here in East Plano, uh, the, near the uh, Los Rios golf, or, you know, previous Los Rios golf course? Hi, Mr. Breeding, this is, uh, Mark Israelson, I'm the city manager. Uh, what's over in um, near Los Rios off of Los Rios and 14th Street is an existing wastewater treatment plant. The Upper East Forest, Upper East Fork Interceptor is actually on the north side of town. So it is a, a separate project um, up there. And that, that uh, particular line uh, helps feed part of our wastewater system, but it is, it is separate than the wastewater treatment plant. That is uh, that has been on the east side of town for uh, a number of years, right? Um, and there has some people in our neighborhood have have uh, talked about it being expanded. Uh, could could you because some are concerned? Uh, sure. I was just wondering if you could uh, expound on what is actually happening out there. What's the progress and what are the plans? Because the uh, the plan originally was for that for that golf course area to be some kind of park uh yes, sir. facility uh, and and that sort of thing and has that changed and and so what's going on with that 
Well, I, I'm actually going to ask two people to, to chime in real quick. The park is still uh, on ongoing. It's it's a plan that is still going to be uh, uh, developed. And I think that there's some uh, work planned for this next year. But what I'm going to ask is Jerry Cause, or excuse me, Jack Carr is, is on the line right here. I'm going to ask him to comment on the wastewater treatment plant. He's been working closely with the uh, water district to uh, to understand their plans and has met with a number of citizens over there. So Jack can provide an update on that. And then we have uh, Dr. Ron Smith is also on the line. He can uh, share a little bit of the update on the plans for the linear park that we have over at Los Rios. So uh, Jack, if you'll go first and then Ron, if you'll follow up, that would be great. Right, good morning, everybody. Uh, that's a great question, Mr. Brading. Um, the issue that you have right now that's in front of city council is a zoning request where the property adjacent to the, um, the district's property, where the treatment plant is right now, uh, they want to put a, an office building to, to put a lab in there, put their, um, their daily uh, crews, the, uh, the SCADA system, which is the, the equipment that actually runs the plant. So that's what you're, you're hearing uh, in front of city council right now. But with that conversation, there's a lot of conversation about um, the, the actual operation of the plant. So this, this work, the, the proposal that they have right now, doesn't expand the average daily capacity of the plant. And that's been um, somewhat misleading the way that uh, some of the residents have been proposing uh, that conversation. Um, right now, the peak capacity is being expanded. And that peak capacity is needed for, I'm gonna call it emergency situations when we get a lot of rainwater that enters into the system and it overwhelms the, the um, the capacity of the, the actual plant. So dropping back, the plant has a permit that is issued by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. And with that, they have a maximum amount that they can release on an average daily basis. But like I just said, that during rain events, they have more rain that actually enters the plant and they need to be able to, to uh, take care of that. And what they're doing is they're expanding the peak portion of the plant capacity. So the plant per se is not being expanded like is being talked about. It's being expanded from a peak standpoint, but not the average daily capacity. So I'd, uh, keep that in mind when you hear the, uh, the plant e expansion. So the zoning case right now is for a building that's being constructed. The uh, peak capacity is a project that can be completed and actually is currently being completed without that zoning case. And just a further explanation of the Upper East Fork interceptor system, the, um, the water district has a series of cities that all work together as a region. And the region system is called the Upper East Fork interceptor system. We have a portion of the, the fee that goes into that. And then that is uh, distributed back to the city to help pay for some of our infrastructure that, uh, that feeds into the system. So does that answer your question, Mr. Breeding? Uh, yes, on the uh, thank you uh, on the expansion uh, to for the peak capacity. Does that involve many buildings, or is that just something they're doing underground? Uh, what what is that? What does that involve? So let's let's talk about the the uh, the overall area as two different components. You have the track that doesn't have anything on it right now. Uh, that is the zoning case that they're wanting to build a building, and then you have the existing. Uh, treatment plant. The existing treatment plant, they're making improvements to their different components and um, adding uh, additional capacity there on that site. So the building and the zoning isn't going okay. to be a treatment unit. And that is a critical element because the zoning that is coming through is going to explicitly say that they cannot add more treatment units on that property. Okay. That's that's actually a very uh, that's a huge sticking point between uh, the two groups. Okay, uh, and, and then the uh, the building for the office, uh, I'm assuming they have to build that up because that's a flood zone. Is that correct? That's not. It's uh, the flood zone is uh, west or east of the uh, the existing treatment plant. Okay. This is west of. Ron, okay. would, you, uh, would you provide a, an update on the, the linear park that's going on at Los Rios, please? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mr. Breeding, thank you for the question. 
the uh, former Los Rios golf course, uh, Los Rios Park, uh, the majority of the park property is in the floodplain. So uh, a lot of the progress is hinging on flood studies that are conducted through governmental agencies and those take a lot of time. We are phasing in the project. The first phase was the removal of the existing cart path, which has already been accomplished. The next phase that you will see out there will be the construction of the new hike and bike trail that will uh, go through the majority of the property, the, connecting Bob Woodruff Park to the Cottonwood Creek Trail that goes um, north-south. So that will be the next phase of construction. Those plans are currently going through uh, internal review process, and then there will be the extensive studies that will make sure that any construction that happens in that area will not compound any flooding that is um, common in that area when we have big rain events. As far as the overall development of the project, again, it's going to be phased in. So the full development of the project is still years away. Uh, the next thing, as I said, you'll see will be the construction of the concrete trail. All right. Well, thank you. That clears up some things, things I can answer questions from the neighborhood that they ask. Great. Other questions? Hi, this is uh, Steve Levine, and uh, I have a question uh, concerning the uh, beautification program uh, that's uh, available to uh, HOAs. Um, uh, as we've been talking, there was a lot of freeze damage and for HOAs with uh, a significant amount of common area and uh, landscaping, we experienced uh, a great deal of uh, freeze damage. Uh, in our HOA alone, it's been estimated to be uh, uh, in excess of $100,000. Um, we participate in the beautification program, which provides matching uh, funds uh, from the city uh, to us for uh, landscaping and other beautification projects. But uh, based on the limits of that program, it's going to take many years for us to uh, recover uh, and uh, uh, replace the, the landscaping. I'm wondering if uh, something can be done uh, through this year or next year's uh, funds from uh, the government uh, federal government to expand that program uh, so that uh, we can recover much faster and uh, uh, continue to beautify our, uh, our, our HOAs in our city. So I'll, I'll ask Lori Schwartz to, to chime in here in just one second, but I, I will share that um, it, we do not have additional funds programmed right now in the, uh, in the budget. Um, we do realize we're in a recovering economy, but for both our residences and our uh, our commercial um, partners in the community. So right now, uh, as part of my recommended budget, we did not set aside uh, additional funds for that. Next year may be a different story. We actually have a second tranche of dollars coming back in from the, the federal government next year, and we have not programmed those funds. Uh, so those will come back for council consideration uh, next year. Um, but this year's allocation, as Karen shared, we did not have uh, those funds uh, recommended uh, towards that use. But I'll ask Lori Schwartz to uh, provide any additional details she'd like. To sure. And earlier this year, right after we had um, the winter storm, we did set aside um, the additional funding left from the first cycle of grants um, to try and assist the homeowners with the homeowner associations with their damaged trees. Um, and we, we did in fact have several uh, neighborhoods that took advantage of that special winter storm funding. This year uh, for the fall cycle, um, which we've just uh, reviewed applications for, we had um, a lot of requests. Um, we had eight new uh, neighborhood associations come in. Um, a lot of the applications included some portion of damaged trees. Um, so we are very aware that this is a concern across neighborhoods in the city. Um, we will. We did get a, a substantial number of requests, and so we expect to expend all of the money that we've been given this year from 
uh, last year's city council budget. So, um, you know, we're continuing to explore options to see uh, if there is any additional assistance we can give with this. And so uh, just know it's on the top of our minds. Um, we are trying to think about how we can best assist neighborhoods with this. We do know that it's going to be substantial, um, but we're, we're continuing to keep uh, options open and continuing to look for opportunities that we can assist in that way. Thank you. Of course. Hello, hello, folks. Uh, Ed Sanders here. I'm going to put on my church lock hat, you know, and share praise this morning. Um, so, Mayor Munns, good meeting you. Welcome aboard. Uh, good to see lots of familiar faces here. Um, by day, I'm a technology specialist for Microsoft, and during the evening and weekends, I help seniors with their technology. So, Mark, please thank uh, everyone involved. We I was pleasantly surprised to find that we now have Wi-Fi at the Plano Senior Center. Matter of fact, uh, last week I had an outage at home and I went there and worked because my Wi-Fi was not available at home. So I was like, wow. So uh, that's a praise. And up until recently, we were probably the only, but definitely one of few cities that had a senior center without Wi-Fi. And it's good to see that's been corrected. So thank you very much. Happy you're enjoying that and happy you're taking use of what we consider one of our jewels in this community, which is a, a fantastic senior center over there. So glad that you got use for it and we really appreciate that feedback. Any other questions? So actually, of course, I have another one since no one else is chiming in. Um, there's a lot of myths about tree trimming removal and I've been telling people, no, 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 no. But one of those is people are somehow believing that during bulk pickup, the city is going to clean up all these piles. And I just want to confirm that that is not true and that people need to reduce the piles or or call and schedule a special pickup. We, we actually have Jerry Cosgrove uh, attending. He's on the line. And I'm going to see if Jerry, Jerry Cosgrove is our director of public works. And he can, he's over our environmental waste group as well. And Jerry can actually provide clarification on that. We will actually pick it up. Some of it during the regular collection, some of it during bulky waste, but there is a limit to how much we will pick up. So in most cases, if you're taking down a large tree, it's more than we can handle. So we ask that you get your, whoever you hire to take it along with them because it, it puts a real burden on our system for us to do it. And in many cases, if you don't want to do a paid collection, then it may be four or five weeks before we pick up the whole pile. It's just, there's a lot of material out there and it's putting a real stress on our employees to try to pick all that stuff up. Well, with that, Mayor Munns, we'll throw it back to you to close. And I think we're right on time. Thank you all for attending the virtual neighborhood leadership meeting. Uh, we'll, we'll send you an email with links to presentations and resources related to this morning's topic so that uh, you can reference those if you have more questions today. And uh, again, thank you so much for attending. And uh, with that being said, we'll, we'll be dismissed. Thanks again. Have a great weekend.